Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Nick Burns, professor here at the Kennedy School. It's a great pleasure to welcome all of you to the John F. Kennedy Jr. Forum and to the Kennedy School. And a great pleasure for me to welcome uh, my friend, His Excellency Hussein Akani, the ambassador of the Islamic Republic of Pakistan to the United States. We're going to have a brief conversation here. I'm going to say very little. The ambassador is going to talk a lot. He's got some things he wants to say. And then after that, we'll go to questions. I think all of you know the drill. There are four microphones here, but I will rehearse that with you before we get, begin the question and answer period. Let me say a word about our guest this evening. He is no stranger to Harvard. He's been to the forum before. He's spoken at the school many times. He was a professor at Boston University, associate professor for international relations. And so he's been part of the academic community here. But more importantly for this evening, he was born in Karachi in 1956, a very good year. Uh, he was educated there at the University of Karachi. He began his career as a journalist in high school. He worked as a journalist in Pakistan and in the Far East, in Hong Kong, for many years, and then became a government official, serving three times as a special assistant and minister to three Pakistani prime ministers, most notably in the government of Prime Minister Benazir Bhutto, where he was Minister of State for Information, spokesman of the Pakistani government in the 1990s. He's someone who has been arguing for Pakistan and Pakistan's point of view throughout his career all over the world. He has written more than 390 op-ed pieces alone and numerous books, so he's a prolific author. Uh, and he's someone who has been uh, very much in the limelight as ambassador in Washington, D.C. Some of my closely placed friends tell me one of the most effective ambassadors in Washington of all the countries there now is Dr. Hussein Akani. But perhaps his, um, for this audience, here um, in this part of the world, another claim to fame, and I just found out about this, that he is uh, a, a member of Red Sox Nation. So we're very, very pleased about that. Um, Mr. Ambassador, this speech, uh, your speech tonight, is of course sponsored by the Institute of Politics, which is which runs the forum. It's also co-sponsored by the Belfer Center for Science and International Affairs, where I teach, where Professor O'Sullivan, Megan O'Sullivan, teaches. And it's co-sponsored by two of our student groups, the South Asia Caucus here at the Kennedy School and the Pakistan Student Association at the Kennedy School. You've just had the opportunity to meet some of the Pakistani students. We have a great group of Pakistani students, Indian students, Nepali students, Sri Lankan and Bangladeshi students. They have come together to organize this new emphasis on South Asia at the Kennedy School. We're beginning a new program. And I have to pay attention to Ziad Haider, who is here, who has been helping us to get this program off the ground. And so, so without further ado, Ambassador, um, I'll ask you one leading question. Speak as long as you wish. I'll have a few more questions, and then we'll go to the audience. First question. You have to have the most difficult job in Washington, D.C. of any ambassador, because your country is at the heart of all the challenges in the region of the world that I think most Americans in the Obama administration or in the Bush administration would say is now the most vital part of the world for our country, and that's South Asia. So what's it like to be the Pakistani ambassador of the United States? But more importantly, what are your primary objectives as you relate to the American government and the American people, and how can we push ahead to create a closer and better uh, US relationship with Pakistan. Thank you very much, Nick. Of course, people probably didn't uh, understand when you said that 1956 was a very good year. It was not because I was born in it, but because you were born in that Both year boys. as well. Uh, of course, the Yankees won the World Series that Which is year. A tragedy. So that wasn't, that was, that was. There's that only was, one Yankees fan. That here wasn't, that wasn't sure. particularly good. But uh, <laughs> the important thing is Pakistan got its first constitution that year as well. And uh, you know, I became sort of active in politics when I was about eight or nine, actually, you know, like kids do sometimes, and had a bee in my bonnet about democracy in Pakistan. And my mom, who, God, uh, God bless her soul, she's 90 now, but she says, you know, it seems that uh, I sort of, you didn't want to be born till Pakistan actually had a constitution. So uh, since then, uh, now, of course, Pakistan not only has a constitution, but we have a constitutional consensus. Um, and I'll come to that in a minute. Let me just begin by saying that when people say that I have the most difficult job in Washington, D.C., um, I always say that I hope you're not uh, implying uh, that it's so difficult that only I was willing to take it because, you know, nobody else wants the job. 
Uh, I don't think it's that difficult. It's not difficult because there's great realization in Pakistan and there's great realization in the United States that we both need each other. Pakistan and the United States have been the best of friends and they've been the worst of friends in the last 62 years. And the reason for that has been that Pakistan and the US have always opted to have a transactional relationship. Uh, during the 1950s, the Eisenhower administration was looking for an ally in South Asia. India wasn't willing to be one. Because of non-alignment, Pakistan needed support in its uh, efforts to protect itself against India, and Pakistan was a willing ally. And there's a funny story about that, actually. Walter Lippmann and uh, uh, John Foster Dulles had a, a meeting uh, soon after Dulles' first visit to Pakistan. And Dulles was trying to persuade Lippmann that it was a good idea to have Pakistan as an ally, and Lippmann was a critic. So Dulles uh, said to uh, Lippmann, look here, uh, Walter. We need an ally in the South of Asia to fight the communists, and the only people who know how to fight in South Asia are uh, the Gurkhas. That's why I have signed Pakistan on as allies. Uh, Lipman turned around and said, but Foster, the Gurkhas are not, uh, the Pakistanis are not Gurkhas, and the Gurkhas are not Pakistanis. Dallas paused for a moment and turned around and said, oh, really? But they are Muslims, aren't they, the Gurkhas? <laughs> and he says, no, they're not. Uh, the Gurkhas are Hindus. John Foster Dulles turned around and said, who the heck cares? We needed an ally and we've got one. So that's how this alliance was born. That's how this alliance was born and that's why there was not much depth to it. Over the years, we've seen Pakistan and the US work together in the war against the Soviets in Afghanistan. Pakistan became the staging ground. But the United States walked away when the Soviets walked away. And so the Pakistani narrative is that the United States walks away from Pakistan when it no longer needs it. The American narrative is that the Pakistanis are too India-centric and they have their own objectives and they only use America for advancing their military capability vis-a-vis -vis, uh, India. And they really do not share America's values. Well, now Pakistan has a democratic government. We have been able to forge a constitutional consensus uh, after a long time, uh, bring our constitution back on track. Uh, Pakistan has had military regimes, and un uh, 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 unfortunately, all periods of close American and Pakistani cooperation have uh, been the periods of uh, military rule in Pakistan. So there's been a general tendency in Pakistan as well as outside to think that there is only a commonality between the American so-called security establishment and the Pakistani security establishment. In the last two years, we've been working, and we started it during the Bush administration and are carrying it forward during the Obama administration, an effort to try and create a strategic partnership independent of the transactions that we may have to undertake at any given moment. So right now, for example, the United States needs Pakistani assistance, and Pakistan needs American assistance in fighting terrorism. Uh, Pakistanis realize that terrorism is a threat to our way of life. Terrorism has taken more lives in Pakistan in the last uh, uh, more soldier, no more Pakistani soldiers have died because of terrorism than the soldiers of any other country except the Americans in Iraq. And Pakistan has had more civilian casualties, including the loss of Benazir Bhutto as a result of terrorism. So there is great will in Pakistan to co cooperate with the United States in rooting out terrorism, as well as have a new outlook and understand that a partnership with the United States does not mean that America and Pakistan will agree on everything. We will not. No two countries ever agree 100% on everything. Uh, we will have differences. America and Pakistan will not always have the same view of India, for example. Uh, but that said, there is much that we can do together. And we've seen that now uh, Congress, for example, when they passed the Kerry Luga legislation last year, uh, coming up with a commitment of one and a half billion dollars in civilian assistance, unconditional civilian assistance to Pakistan for education, health care, and infrastructure uh, for a period of five years and possibly ten, basically reassured the people of Pakistan that America will not desert Pakistan. Pakistan, for its part, has undertaken military operations in Swat and South Waziristan. Uh, we have arrested several people, including those uh, um, uh, belonging to the Afghan Taliban, even in the city of Karachi, the arrest of Mullah Barada. Uh, we are trying to bring our intelligence services in greater harmony, uh, getting the militaries to work together much more closely, uh, to create a hammer and anvil strategy in which when the American forces operate in Afghanistan, they are the hammer, Pakistani forces the anvil, and when the Pakistani forces operate on the Pakistani side of the Pakistan-Afghan border, they are the hammer and the, uh, the American forces 
and the NATO forces the anvil in Afghanistan. So we're trying to change the direction, the fundamentals of this relationship. And to answer your original question, changing the fundamentals of anything are never easy. Mm -hmm. And if you are a person who is sort of known for his fondness for baseball in a country that actually likes cricket, uh, you also come under attack a lot. There are people in Pakistan who wonder, does this man represent Pakistani interests or American interests? It's very difficult sometimes to argue constantly that maybe our interests do converge. So it's a tough job. It's as tough in Washington, D.C. as it is in Islamabad. And, um, but I'm doing it, or at least trying to do it. Thank you very much. Let's start with, um, Mr. Ambassador, the issues on the front page of our newspapers the last two days. A Pakistani American arrested by federal and local authorities on suspicion of having planted a bomb in a car in the middle of Times Square on a busy Saturday evening. This has got to be a difficult issue between the two governments. How can the two governments work together so that these types of incidents uh, can be eliminated? And, and on the broader issue of terrorism, how is it going with the United States and your agenda of trying to prevent terrorism in both countries? I read the newspaper this morning. This individual claims to have been trained by a terrorist group inside Pakistan. Well, the good news, of course, is that uh, uh, this man did not succeed in his objective. He did not succeed in killing men, women, and children in Times Square. And for that, we have to uh, be grateful uh, uh, and, and, and thankful. He was also caught. Um, now, individuals like this exist, uh, and uh, many of them in the past have had uh, associations and affiliations with various kinds of groups, some of which were trained by various governments, including the United States and Pakistan, uh, in the hope of fighting communism during the 1980s. Uh, there's a long history to it, and we no, need not get into that history. Uh, we understand that history. The important thing is, how do we make sure that new recruits do not join the ranks of terrorists, and those who are already trained terrorists are actually found and put out of business. And on that, it has to be an intelligence-led war. Pakistan and the United States are cooperating much more now. You listen to a lot fewer complaints now than you did two years ago about uh, what Pakistan's role is in this effort. Also, it's important to deny the, uh, the extremists, the Taliban in particular, um, uh, control of territory. So for example, in Swat, in South Waziristan, where they can actually control territory and therefore were able to provide a safe haven for anybody who wanted to come and train, uh, that denial of territory is important. We still have a problem, and the problem is very simple. We have some very remote parts, especially in the, north, uh, in the, in the northwest of Pakistan, in the tribal areas adjoining the Pashtun Khwa province of Pakistan and Afghanistan. Uh, they have had a peculiar structure of state. Now the government of Pakistan has declared that we are going to try and make it part of the normal system of governance, but they didn't until recently. Uh, there are uh, remnants of the uh, anti-Soviet jihad still in that area. Um, and the remoteness, uh, the history, uh, the, uh, the, the fact that we did not have many troops committed to that area until recently, uh, the difficulties of governance in Afghanistan have all helped the extremists rather than the two governments of Afghanistan and Pakistan. Now Pakistan, United States, and Afghanistan are working together. And we, uh, we are working together to make sure that we can ensure control of that border. Uh, at the same time, we are trying to expand the influence of the Pakistani forces in all parts of the federally administered tribal areas along Afghanistan. Uh, we, have a, we have much more control over South Waziristan and Bajor and Swat than we do over North Waziristan, for example. But we do have a military presence there, and we will go there as well. I think, for the first time, the Americans are understanding that it is not a lack of will, but a lack of capacity that has prevented Pakistan from taking certain actions. And the Pakistanis understand that the Americans are not just putting pressure on Pakistan, but they actually want to be Pakistan's partner in dealing with what is a shared problem. President Zardari and Prime Minister Gilani have repeatedly said, and this is a difference from what General Musharraf used to say. General Musharraf used to say, we are fighting a war because America and the international community want us to fight. The elected leaders of Pakistan are saying, we are fighting Pakistan's war and we are seeking the international community's support in fighting that war. That makes a difference. 
The biggest difference has come in Pakistani public opinion. Two years ago, opinion polls indicated that many Pakistanis were ambivalent about the Taliban. Only 20%, 22% of Pakistanis actually thought the Taliban were a threat to Pakistan. Now, 83% of Pakistanis think that the Taliban pose a challenge and a threat to Pakistan and Pakistan's uh, uh, sovereignty. And that is a very positive development. Anti-Americanism is still very common in Pakistan. And that impairs the judgment of a lot of people when it comes to making choices in relation to uh, uh, the war against terror. People end up thinking that, you know, uh, do we want to become part of some grand American design? The conspiracy theories are pretty rampant in Pakistan. And we need to still deal with those. So that's the next stage. But at this stage, I think the state of cooperation, Nick, is much better than it was earlier. And I would grant you that. I think there's no question if you compare the state of US cooperation with Pakistan now to what it was, say, four or five years ago, it is better. And I think it's recognized in Washington and throughout the United States that the Pakistani government, the military, the civilian government are, are doing more to counter terrorism within Pakistan. But there are two areas that still raise questions. Quetta, the Quetta Shura, home base of some of the Taliban who are a major problem for American forces in Afghanistan, and of course, as you mentioned, North Waziristan. What more can and should your government and will your government be doing to combat the terrorist forces there? First of all, let me deal with what we will uh, and would like to do. We would certainly like to put all Taliban, whether their primary target is Afghanistan or Pakistan, out of business. For that, we are willing to consider all options. Military option, the process of reconciliation and reintegration, because after all, you can't kill everybody. You have to deal with the foot soldiers. You have to deal with those who are willing to come and negotiate and talk. And I think that will have to be an Afghan-led process in Afghanistan and a Pakistan-led process in Pakistan. So, so, so the ambiguity of the past is gone. There is no ambiguity whether it's North Waziristan, whether there are elements uh, in the south of the country, wherever they are. After a Mullah Brother uh, uh, was arrested in Karachi, there have been other arrests that have not been publicized. And, you know, uh, 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 and we will continue to do that. And we are doing that together. We are doing it in cooperation uh, with, 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 with the US side. But let me just go one step further and say that uh, in, uh, the, the problem area so far has been a lack of trust, uh, a lack of trust on the part of Pakistani uh, intelligence and military thinking that the Americans only want certain very limited objectives and do not want to support us in ours. And a lack of trust on the American side that the Pakistanis want to protect certain groups and individuals as potential assets uh, for Afghanistan. Now, we are very clear, and when our Army Chief General Kiani was in Washington recently during the strategic dialogue, he clearly stated, he said that Pakistan does not want anything for Afghanistan that it does not want for ourselves. Relations between Pakistan and Afghanistan are a lot better today than they were ever before. We have some concern. Our biggest security concern is that we do not want to be caught in a pincer movement in which we do not have our problems with India resolved. And then we have an Afghanistan in which India's presence is overwhelming. And then at some point, we get squeezed from both sides and the Americans are not there to help us. At this moment, we are trying to address that problem between our two countries and our two governments, and we are making progress. Now, uh, when it comes to uh, dealing with groups such as the uh, Taliban leaders from the southern part of Afghanistan, we have offered the Americans now that they should share intelligence with us. And there's a difference. There's a difference from when you were in government and the same issue used to come up. Now, actual intelligence sharing is taking place. Uh, the American intelligence community and the Pakistani intelligence community work much more closely together than they did, say, two to three years ago. And it is trust, of course. Building trust is a process. It's not an event. It doesn't happen in one go. So we will slowly and gradually build this trust further. The important thing is we recognize each other as partners. And there is greater recognition in Washington today than ever before that Pakistan has no interest whatsoever in the preservation of the Taliban in any way. They do not represent the values we represent. We do not want them to rule Afghanistan, and we certainly do not want them to rule Pakistan. We do not want the, uh, the, 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 the young women of Afghanistan denied an education, and we do not want the young women of Pakistan denied an education, which is what the Taliban would do if they were ever in power in either side of the, uh, uh, on either side of the Pakistan-Afghanistan border. Thank you. Ambassador, I just have two more questions because we want to go to questions from, from the audience. But 
The first has to deal with, um, with Afghanistan itself. And is it possible to say now, and it wasn't four or five years ago, that there's a common strategy that the Afghan government, the Pakistan government, the American government have so that the Afghan government can be stabilized in Kabul and elsewhere, so that the American military effort can be reinforced with the belief that Pakistan is going to continue to take consistent action against the terrorist groups on Pakistani soil. There's a sense, I think, in this country that's been, it's been episodic and that that effort hasn't been as consistent as it should be, but you seem to be saying that you think the government is committed to that consistent action. I think that the trilateral process that we have created, uh, I don't know if you recall that last year, President Zardari, President Karzai, and President Obama uh, had a trilateral meeting, all three together. Uh, and if you recall that meeting, it was very different from when President Bush attempted a meeting between General Musharraf and President Karzai. You will probably remember that meeting, particularly for the refusal of either one of them to shake each other's hand. And now here was the Pakistani president and the Afghan president hugging each other and joking with each other uh, 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 and talking about each other as brother. So I think we do have a trilateral mechanism in place, Nick, and I think that we do have a strategy. Um, and I think, look, let's, be, let's give credit where it's due. People have been critical in the last two years of how you know, the American administration has taken its time in developing uh, elements of its strategy in relation to Afghanistan. But taking time, some patience is, 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 is a virtue sometimes. And I think that taking the time that they did, they worked every element out with the Afghan leadership and with us. And, President, and Prime Minister Gilani was here during the nuclear summit. Uh, President Karzai is coming here uh, soon. And the Americans keep Pakistan fully informed of all engagements with Afghanistan, and they keep the Afghans fully informed of all engagements with Pakistan. So it's a, it's, a, it's, it's, it's a triangular process in which we are working together to make sure that everybody feels comfortable uh, about the strategic direction we are taking. And the stability of Afghanistan is now a major objective of Pakistan. Pakistan wants a stable Afghanistan. An unstable Afghanistan has had consequences for Pakistan. Pakistan's economic development is being held up because of the uh, instability in Afghanistan. It all started with the war against the Soviets. And that was a noble cause, bringing the Soviet communist state down. But let's face it, we ended up having what Pakistan is referred to as the Klashnikov culture uh, in Pakistan with, with too many people with too many guns around. And we want to get over it and move forward. And I think that the key to that is a stable Afghanistan, but a, an, a stable Afghanistan that is positively disposed towards Pakistan and is not used as a base uh, for any military or intelligence operations directed against Pakistan by anyone. I'm sure we'll get questions on that, um, but let me go to one last question that I wanted to ask, and that has to do with India. We have some Indian students here tonight. Um, twice in the last uh, 10, 12 years, Pakistan and India came to the brink of military conflict to nuclear armed countries. There was a period of time during the last few years of President Musharraf's rule where relations seemed to improve. After the attacks on Mumbai in November 2008, of course, relations soured significantly. And perhaps we avoided just narrowly a clash between the two countries. How can your government and the Indian government resurrect a better tone and substance to the relationship and avoid what everybody around the world thinks would be an absolute catastrophe? And that would be a military clash between two countries that have too much power to even think about going to war with each other. But, but Pakistan and India uh, uh, have a lot in common, but we have certain unresolved disputes and issues. Uh, we have resuscitated the, resuscitated the dialogue recently. The composite dialogue. Uh, well, uh, the Indians don't want to call it the composite dialogue. Now, you know about the Indians and Pakistan is enough to know that this is a bad divorce with nuclear weapons. Uh, it's, uh, it's, 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 it's sort of neither side can talk to each other without reference to some event in the past. And so it's, uh, uh, there's, there's a lot of emphasis on semantics, etc. So the Indians don't want to call it the composite dialogue now because they think the composite dialogue was undermined in the past. So a so dialogue we, was A dialogue commenced. has started. Our yeah. prime minister met uh, with the prime minister of India on the sidelines of uh, the SARC summit in Thimpu. This is not going to happen quickly. I mean, if it was in my control, people probably in this audience who have heard me speak elsewhere before know my views on it. I personally feel that we, this is too precious and important a relationship for both of us to blow it. 
India and Pakistan need to work together. We need to free the resources for our children and for our, uh, for our poor. Uh, India is economically uh, on the verge of a major takeoff. Uh, Pakistan can benefit from that. Uh, instead of looking upon itself as sitting at the crossroads of conflict, uh, Pakistan can look upon itself as sitting at the crossroads of opportunity. Uh, and, and, and this would be a tremendous opportunity for Pakistan to work with India. But at the same time, we must understand that nations have views of each other. Uh, Canada and the United States. I mean, there was a time when, uh, you know, doesn't even, even remember the Oregon Wars. Anybody who's a history major, you know, would probably remember that. But, but now Canada and the United States are in a different mold. And so Pakistan and India also have to look at a future that is different from the past. There will be a time when people will be learning about the 1965 war and the 1971 war in school books, but it will not be something that will have relevance to their day-to-day -day life. That said, you cannot have a dialogue while ignoring the issues that really tear you apart. And so the Pakistani view is we should have a dialogue, we should move forward with the things that bring us together, but do not ignore the things that are also the cause of dispute between us. For example, Jammu and Kashmir. And they should be part of the process of talking to each other, even though uh, they do not need to hold up the process of talking to one another. On terrorism, we understand India's concerns. When the attacks took place in Mumbai, everybody in Pakistan felt the pain. It is unfair to think that there were people in Pakistan who uh, did not realize that this could happen in one of our cities tomorrow. Terrorism is something that is evil, and terrorists have shown repeatedly that they do not make a distinction. And these I mean, terrorists came from Pakistan. Uh, yes, uh, we'll talk about that in a minute, but let me just say that we felt the pain. Then came the question of where these terrorists came from. And Pakistan said that we are willing to cooperate with the Indians in identifying where they come from. All intelligence that was shared with, uh, by, uh, with, by the Indians with Pakistan was acted upon. People were arrested in Pakistan and they are on trial right now. But let me say something, Nick. Pakistan has become a country, uh, a democratic country after many years of authoritarian rule. We are trying to build a society based on rule of law. You know, we have our own little difficulties, and the Pakistanis here know we all have strong arguments among ourselves about you know, whether the country is going in the right direction or not, et cetera, et cetera. But the fact of the matter is we have a strong judiciary, and that's good for Pakistan. Now, if our judges say, you know what? Fine, these guys are being accused of, of, of being behind the Mumbai bombings, but where's the evidence? then the Indians have to share the evidence, not just to convince me or the Prime Minister or the Foreign Minister of Pakistan, but to be able to make this a judiciable process. And, and we are working together on doing that. We just have too much of baggage, both sides. Indians still feel that, you know, there's all this history of the last several years, Pakistanis have their set of issues. That's why I call it the bad divorce. You know, you've decided to part company, but whenever you come together, you still can't forgive each other for something that happened in the past. But right now, everybody in Pakistan agrees that groups and individuals in Pakistan who undertake any kind of terrorism against anyone, including India, are people who are enemies of the Pakistani state as well as the international community, and we will act against them. So. Indian political public opinion was a little against concessions to Pakistan after Mumbai, and that made it difficult for India to resume the negotiating process. I think Prime Minister Manmohan Singh has taken a bold step in restoring the process, and this will yield much better results than in the past, because now you have an elected government in Pakistan that is absolutely committed to normalizing relations with India. Very good. Thank you very much, and thank you for your candor, and thank you for holding forth for such a long time. I'll give you a break just for a minute while I explain the rules of the road here. So we have two microphones here. We have two right here in the first balcony. Anyone can ask a question. Three ground rules. You must state your name. You must ask a question. And your question must end with a question mark. Mir, you'll begin. Assalamu alaikum, Ambassador Khani. Thank you for being with us. My name is Mir. I'm a Pakistani student here. Uh, through your book and your relationships especially, you have revealed to the world and Americans that uh, the link between the Pakistani military and militants in the past, which has laid the seeds to the current extremism in Pakistan. 
You've also linked past US support to dictatorships which have watered these very seeds. My question is, do you think Pakistan would be in the present security chaos it is in now if the US had not attacked Afghanistan? My second question as a follow-up, I've also heard that you are a very effective ambassador, probably the most effective ambassador Pakistan has had. But in that context, many within the Pakistani government have estimated the cost of the war on terror to Pakistan's economy to, that, to be that of $35 billion. What are you doing to recover this loss? And what are you going to be doing to pursue the punitive damages that haven't even been assessed yet? Uh, first of all, I do not think, I, I personally, and this has to be a personal response because it's a personal question rather than a government question. Uh, I think personally, um, the US decision to go to war in Afghanistan immediately after 9-11 is not the sole reason for the problems in Pakistan. For example, the 1999 coup in Pakistan had already taken place. So therefore, one cannot say that the military rule came to Pakistan in the aftermath of 9-11. Similarly, General Musharraf was already in power. So any mistake that he subsequently made cannot be put at the doorstep of the United States. You and I have discussed this, and I have discussed this with many other Pakistani audiences. I think we as Pakistanis now need to go beyond just blaming the United States for everything that happens in our country. Uh, or, or, or anybody else. We have to take responsibility. The war in Afghanistan, yes, the United States wanted to fight the Soviet Union, but Pakistan also had options at that time, and we decided, or our leaders at that time decided otherwise. We, I was one of those who was actually very positive about the war in Afghanistan because I wanted to see the communists defeated. We didn't calculate all the consequences. Now, we are becoming more mature and we are trying to calculate consequences, but we need to take some responsibility. So I don't think that all that is happening in Pakistan is simply a consequence of the beginning of the war in Afghanistan uh, after 9-11. I think it's a consequence of cumulative decisions beginning with the Soviet march into Afghanistan in 1979 and including the notion that somehow we can have a bunch of uh, uh, people from all over the world brought into Pakistan and launch them against the Soviets with a hardline ideology. And then when the Soviets leave, we can leave without actually toning down that ideology and kind of unbrainwash the people that we have already brainwashed. So that, I think, is the mistake that we need to all talk about. And that may, the Americans made a contribution. I mean, we all know that uh, uh, J for Jihad was an idea that was crafted in the University of Nebraska here. Uh, to teach the kids, the Afghan and Pakistani kids who were involved in jihad. Um, and, 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 and yes, that was a mistake. But it wasn't solely an American mistake. It was a mistake of many, many actors and players. As far as the cost of war for Pakistan is concerned, again, um, the, the cost that has been estimated is multidimensional. It's the cost to our economy. It's the cost to our uh, state institutions. It's the cost to our military, etc. The United States offers us reimbursement for costs for the military. We are working with the United States right now to make sure that we get um, significant inputs, not only of economic assistance, but also of American investment. Problem with investment is that investors always want to invest based on pure sound, and there are many business majors here uh, who would affirm that, pure sound business uh, uh, reasons. So what we are trying to do is match the investment uh, climate in Pakistan uh, to our desire and need for investment funds. Uh, but uh, I am sufficiently realistic, and thank you for considering me effective in Washington. I guess the reason why I'm effective in Washington is because I'm some, some sufficiently realistic to think that if anybody thinks that the US Congress will someday write a check for $35 billion for Pakistan as the loss sustained in the war against terror, then that is never going to happen. It never happened with any other country either. A Marshall Plan-like input is definitely something that I have myself advocated and the government of Pakistan has called for. But again, that will be an input that would involve aid, investment, and for that matter, uh, many kinds of interaction for which Pakistan would also have to create a facilitative environment and, 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 and that, uh, that will be Pakistan's responsibility. Uh, Pakistan is getting assistance from the United States. We could do with more. We can always do with more assistance. But there are a lot of things we need to do in Pakistan and on the Pakistani side too. 
and Carrie Luger is quite substantial, one of the largest USAID programs anywhere in the world. Absolutely. I mean, it's amazing how, for example, people don't realize the Marshall Plan wasn't very big in terms of dollar figures. It wasn't. It was, it was you know, and, and the Kerry Luger bill is one of the largest aid packages that the United States has ever given to a single country. Uh, but then aid should be utilized to generate more resources. And so we are looking for market access right now. We expect that there will be legislation that will uh, open up uh, the American. America has some very protective tariffs on Pakistan, against Pakistani textiles. Pakistan is primarily a textile exporting nation, and we hope that that will come about. But we are also looking at American assistance in diversifying our exports, in, in, in expanding our economy, and training our people. But look, only 58% of school-going age children, children between the age of 5 and 15, go to school in Pakistan. Now, that is not the result of Afghanistan's, uh, America's war in Afghanistan. And that is not the result of Kerry Luger or pre-Kerry Luger or whatever. It's something that is a result of a, Now, if we had a more skilled workforce, economic and uh, uh, export diversification would be quicker. So this has to be, look, if we're going to be partners, we all have to be learned to be candid with one another. And while we are candid in asking the Americans for assistance in resolving issues that we think the Americans have helped create in our country, we should also be realistic about where things may have gone wrong at our end. Thank you. Anirudh. Um, thank you, Professor Burns. Uh, and thank you, uh, Ambassador Khani, for coming and speaking to us today. Uh, I'm Anirudh Suri. I'm at the Harvard Kennedy School. My question pertains to the comment you cited off uh, with about the US-Pakistan relationship often being simply a transactional relationship. And I was wondering if you, and you started to touch upon this um, just now, can you talk to us about your vision for how this US-Pakistan uh, US partnership can actually become a much more broad-based partnership? And I, I, one point of reference that I have in mind is the US-India partnership, which has gone on from being simply a political strategic partnership to a much broader partnership. And it's a complex web of uh, interactions uh, between the two countries. And I'm wondering if there's a vision in Pakistan, the government, to make the US-Pakistan partnership really a broad-based one so that it no longer ends up being a transactional one. Absolutely, the Anirudh. Uh, the recent strategic dialogue between Pakistan and the United States identified 10 areas of cooperation, beginning with the A of agriculture all the way to the W of water, uh, water management. And basically that means taking advantage of American experiences in agriculture to increase our yields, uh, something that India did at one point. And so, for example, in Punjab on the Indian side of the border, the yields are much higher than on the Pakistani side because of better seed, better fertilizer, and better water, water utilization. We want the Americans to be able to transfer that knowledge to us uh, and, and technology to us. We want it in every respect. There are fewer Pakistani students in American universities uh, proportionately. Of course, we understand India's population is several the times. The more. numbers are extraordinary. Yeah, the numbers are extraordinary. There are 103,000 F1 visas issued to Indian students and only 5,298, including all those who are here on F1 visas. That's, that's just not proportionate to our population difference. Uh, the number of uh, uh, Pakistani origin professors in American universities uh, is only 5% of the number of the professors of Indian origin, et cetera, et cetera. So it's just, you know, it's those things that have created the India-US uh, partnership, and that's what we want to do with Pakistan. And this is not just to compare, this is just as a reference, because, you know, we don't want to compete with India. We want to look forward to a period of cooperation and friendship with India. Um, but it's important to understand the numbers. Pakistan, a nation of 180 million people, can certainly have much more. And then, and then, we have to also take into account the Faisal Shahzad uh, factor, meaning, Pakistanis who come to the United States should come here and do come here to pursue the American dream like every other immigrant. But if there are some people who are going to say that they are going to shatter that dream, then they don't work to the advantage of Pakistan. So in my opinion, Mr. Shahzad is actually an enemy of Pakistan more than he's an enemy of America. Because by his action, he has jeopardized the relationship between our two countries and the impression of the hundreds of thousands of Pakistani Americans who are just going about doing their job and being good citizens and pursuing the American dream. And, 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 and we have to change all of that. So basically, the vision we have is of engagement in every sphere, in every possible field, uh, agriculture, uh, education, uh, scientific uh, and technological cooperation, 
healthcare, uh, water management, um, uh, economy, uh, investment. We want Pakistani companies to be able to, we want Pakistani brands to be recognized in the United States. Uh, and we want Pakistan's political discourse to be a little more 21st century and oriented towards as, as not as the uh, outliers of globalization, but as participants in globalization, of course, to Pakistan's advantage, but participants in globalization nonetheless, not as the malcontents of globalization that some people think we have become. So that's the vision, and President Obama has signed off on it, at least so, so, so we are working with the US administration on building that, and Congress. Uh, Senator John Kerry is definitely a hero to Pakistanis. He uh, has been, uh, he has been uh, conferred with the uh, hilal -e pakistan which is one of our highest honors, along with Senator Luger, Richard Luger of uh, Indiana, because these gentlemen came up with the Kerry-Luger legislation. Which, but it's not just the money uh, that matters. It's the whole concept of an American interest in making sure that all our children can attend school and all our people can have health care and we have an infrastructure that is an infrastructure commensurate with our aspirations as a great nation. Thank you. Ashish. Uh, Salaam alaikum, Ambassador Haqqani. I'm Ashish Khanna. I'm an Indian student at Kennedy School. I couldn't agree more with you on shared history and culture between India and Pakistan. Uh, but my question was that while the journey of complex issues in Kashmir, water, terrorism will take a lot of time, do you feel there is a space for economic cooperation between the two countries? Because there's so much to be gained because of India's growth and other comparative advantages of Pakistan. And if there are areas, which sectors and areas the dialogue should begin in terms of opening up, in terms of an economic integration between the region, because South Asia continues to be one of the least economically integrated regions in the world. Well, I'm not an economist and, uh, 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 and will not go into the details of what are the areas where we will be able to have the uh, economies of scale and advantage, uh, comparative advantage. But I do agree with the whole concept of working together. Uh, I think that uh, our two sides were working very closely together before Mumbai. In fact, the day the Mumbai incident happened, our foreign minister had landed in Delhi to carry forward the composite dialogue. And so we expect that in issues of trade, in issues of, uh, uh, of, of, of uh, sort of uh, uh, travel uh, across the border, uh, we need to move forward more quickly than we have done in the past. And uh, uh, both sides, I mean the business communities of both, side, uh, both sides, the economists of both sides have done a lot of homework on this. There's a lot of body of literature that's already available on what are the subjects and spheres where both countries will get advantage. Pakistani uh, producers would have access to a billion consumers in India whenever uh, uh, we open uh, trade. At the same time, uh, Indian uh, 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 producers would end up having access to 180 million people who, whose tastes are not very different on certain things, you know, when it comes to style of clothes, uh, um, food stuff, et cetera, et cetera. These are things where there are tremendous similarities. So those are areas that we can start off with, and it's only a question of finding the right political environment. Uh, let's be honest, on both sides of the border, there are people who are so angry with one another that they do not want to do the sums first. And I think we, start needing, uh, we, we, we need to start doing the sums and figuring out where there is advantage for our respective peoples and move forward. Thank you, Ashish. Yes. Um, hey, I'm Sophie Fry. I'm a student at the college. Um, in your book, Between the Mosque and the Military, you discussed the entrenched relationship between the government of Pakistan and the military. And I was wondering what you saw the future of this relationship to be and the changes that you hope to see. I think that one of the best things that has happened to Pakistan is that there is a broad consensus in Pakistan that the military is an institution we respect, we like, we want it to do its job, we want it to defend our frontiers, but we don't want it in politics. Um, and that is a consensus that is shared by the military leaders themselves. So the Pakistani military leaders have scrupulously avoided intervention in politics over the last two years. And if we can sustain that momentum, then hopefully we will have the kind of relationship that exists in most countries, in democratic countries, where the major strategic decisions are taken by Congress or Parliament. Uh, uh, political discourse is 
uh, uh, civilians contribute to political discourse uh, having military dimensions, and the military makes inputs into the strategic discussion, and certainly on tactical issues of, of, of how the military will be used. Um, that is the long term. In the short term, of course, the Pakistan military remains a very strong and an important institution, an institution that has wielded power for most of Pakistan's history. So it will take some time. There will always be some civilians who will be even keener than the military itself for the military to intervene politically. You see that all the time. There are people in Pakistan's media who seem to be cheer cheerleaders for a military takeover at the slightest error of the civilian government. They want to sort of, you know, but the good thing is that the Pakistani military is not falling into that temptation and we have military leaders who are willing to understand that the only way Pakistan will grow and develop is by developing all institutions. And all institutions must develop, must develop in their own right through a process in which there will be debate, there will be give and take, and there will be mistakes made as well. So I think that we are moving in that direction, uh, but it's, it's baby steps yet. Thank you. Jamshed. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Ambassador. My name is uh, Jamshed Kazi. I'm, a, I'm from Bangladesh, a mid-career student here. Uh, I'd like to return to the uh, topic of the strategic dialogue, which, which was mentioned earlier, um, which signals a positive shift in the, in the uh, relations, bilateral relations. Um, you mentioned that many topics were, were uh, raised during those uh, discussions, but I understand that one of the issues where not much headway was made is on the issue of civil nuclear energy uh, for, for Pakistan. And um, my, my question to you really is, how important is this issue for Pakistan, given that the country is facing such a uh, major energy crisis? And secondly, um, what, uh, how legitimate are some of the concerns that the international community might have in that that, uh, that acquisition of that technology might fall into the wrong hands? First of all, Pakistan has had 35 years of experience of dealing with nuclear technology, and our record on nuclear safety is impeccable. Uh, people may not have liked the idea that Pakistan undertook a nuclear weapons program, but it's a reality now, and the world has to come to terms with it. Uh, Pakistan did not violate international law because we were not signatories of the non-proliferation treaty. Uh, neither was India, and nor is Israel. So uh, it's, it's a question of finding a new nuclear regime in which India, Pakistan, and for that matter, Israel can also take part, I think. Uh, that is something that people are, have been giving some thought to. Uh, Pakistan was part of the Nuclear Security Summit recently. Uh, I think that we are moving in a direction in which an American, America's understanding and acceptance of Pakistan's nuclear status while continuing to pursue uh, its non-proliferation objectives is increasing. For the Pakistani part, we are trying to find the right balance between protecting our national security interests and ensuring that we have a minimum deterrent and continue to have it uh, because of our particular situation of the neighborhood, and at the same time, joining global non-proliferation efforts. Uh, that's what we are trying to do. Uh, beyond that, this is too specific and too sort of detailed a subject for me to kind of address here, and Nick will appreciate this much more than you. And as far as a civil nuclear deal is concerned, I think Pakistan uh, fulfills the conditions and requirements for having it. It would be good for Pakistan to have a civil nuclear deal so that Pakistan can harness nuclear energy for, its, uh, 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 for civilian use. It will help Pakistan overcome its uh, new, uh, energy shortage, uh, but it's not something that can be uh, sorted out, discussed, uh, or handled in the short term. If I could just follow up and not to put you on the spot. You don't have to answer this if you don't want to, but it seems Nick, to me that... you can put me on the spot. You put me on the spot <laughs> by inviting me here in the first place. It just seems to me that um, with a legacy of AQCOM out there, the idea that Pakistan and the United States could negotiate a civil nuclear deal seems to me to be in the very distant future, but not in the immediate 10, 15, 20 years. I think, Nick, that's a comment from you that I should just learn to live with, uh, just, as, <laughs> just, as, just as you have to learn to live with our aspirations. <laughs> Understood. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Uh, my name is Mariam Chaktai. I'm studying education reform in Pakistan at the Graduate School of Education. I, I've, I'm also representing the Harvard Pakistan Student Group, and I know for a fact that most Pakistani Americans care deeply about Pakistan and want to make a difference. However, as an aspiring politician myself, Many times, that's where it stops, with that willingness 
and there aren't many venues for, for Pakistani Americans to go beyond that. What is your advice to Pakistani Americans, particularly young Pakistani Americans who want to go back and make a difference or perhaps even engage politically? And what is your advice to political parties in Pakistan to engage this brain drain that has, uh, that has affected our country quite a bit for the past few years? Look, I mean, I've, I've been in the business of advising Pakistan's political parties for a long time, but I've decided that I'll put that on hold while I'm ambassador, so I, that, that part I'm not gonna address. Look, Pakistani Americans uh, have a lot to contribute to Pakistan, they have a lot to contribute to America. Uh, most Pakistani Americans come from four professions. They are either doctors, medical doctors, uh, engineers, uh, accountants, or they work in the financial sector. And then there are some small businessmen and, 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 and the odd cab driver in New York. Um, <laughs> the, the, the difference, so the ability to make a difference requires that Pakistani community in the United States also diversify itself. Uh, I can understand, I and mean, I was a rebel. Mom and dad uh, sort of, you know, sided with me when the rest of the family insisted that I have to choose between engineering or medicine, and I said, neither, I'm gonna study political science. Now try and go back about 30 some years ago, 35 years ago, and try and visualize this sort of 16 year kid, 16 year old kid who, who was doing his matriculation in those days, and saying, no, 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 I wanna study politics. I, I, nobody wanted it because what would you do? What job would you do? Uh, journalism doesn't pay. In those days, I used to work part-time as a journalist, and I used to be paid 100 rupees a month. Uh, so that wasn't particularly sort of, you know, attractive. So I understand how, where people have come from. But I think they need to encourage their younger generation to diversify, go into the social sciences, study different subjects, etc., learn the skills and, the, and, and, and get the knowledge that is necessary to uh, for a nation like, uh, to grow. I mean, national leaders, et cetera, you know. Uh, yes, there's the odd medical doctor who makes it to the US Senate, but um, um, one from Oklahoma, if I'm not mistaken. But uh, usually, uh, you know, you have to, it, it's lawyers and international relations experts and sort of policy people and economists, et cetera. So that's one thing. The other thing is, always remember that the real change in Pakistan will come inside Pakistan. So as an aspiring politician, you have to make up your mind. Are you going to be engaged in American politics or are you going to be engaged in Pakistani politics? A lot of people I've encountered here, basically they can't make up their mind. And if you're going to be engaged in Pakistani politics, you have to get there. And you have to make your choices. And last but not least, remember, and this is something many people, especially in the Pakistani American community, tend to forget. Politics is an imperfect process. There will be imperfect politicians, they will, be, they will pursue imperfect policies. It's the process that is important. Pakistan has to remain democratic, and for democratic politics, the educated Pakistani has to identify with the political parties that exist. There are too many Pakistanis who want the ideal, and to use an expression that is commonly used in America, you know, the perfect should not be made the enemy of the good. The political parties we have, they're flawed. Absolutely, I mean, you know, I've, I've spent a lifetime with them, but they are flawed. But they will only become better by engagement. And so make you choose your party closer to your worldview. You know, there's a conservative party which has a certain worldview, there are religious parties, and then there's a social democratic party. You may disagree with the politics of dynasty, etc., etc., but many countries have it. And, and, and if it can't be helped, it can't be helped. The people vote for them. They must see something in it that the ordinary people vote. Just because you've been blessed to have a Harvard education shouldn't make you oblivious to the fact that the people, the, that the basic rule of democracy is that the ordinary person is not stupid. And the ordinary person in Pakistan, if he votes for the political parties that exist in Pakistan, they must see something in them. And so you have to be able to provide them. What we have is patronage-based politics. We have, uh, we have uh, uh, charismatic politics. We need people who can give policy direction to the political parties that exist. Uh, unfortunately, since 1958, we have had a civil bureaucratic elite, uh, a military bureaucratic elite, that has propounded the notion that somehow uh, military officers, civil servants, and technocrats can run a country. Uh, they can run the technocratic part, but politics is what brings nations together. And to be a politician, 
you have to reach out to the people. And reaching out to the people sometimes means having to hug thousands of women in a village uh, and, 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 you know, uh, sort of uh, just listening to them. And that is something you have to be prepared for if you intend to make politics your vocation. Thank you. We have just a couple of minutes left. I know there are a lot of people who want to ask questions. We're not going to be able to take any new people. And if we keep the questions and responses brief, we might be able to get through, through everybody. So we're going to go to you. Hi, thank you for coming. Uh, my name is Nagin Pagahi. I'm a fellow here at the Belfer Center. I'd like to ask you a question about how you see Pakistan's acquisition of a nuclear arsenal having affected decision making in India and Pakistan. Specifically, what actions by India do you think Pakistan's nuclear weapons deter? So that's my first question mark. And does this provide Pakistan with any new opportunities? That's the second one. Thank you. But first of all, we must remember that Pakistan is a reluctant nuclear power. I mean, we wouldn't have pursued nuclear weapons capability if, if, if India hadn't. Uh, India's argument was that uh, India was pursuing nuclear weapons capability simply because uh, they don't think that there should be nuclear apartheid. That was the argument that uh, was given by Indian leaders consistently. Pakistan's argument was not that. Pakistan's argument was we need a nuclear deterrent because we simply cannot keep conventional parity with India in case of a military conflict. Now, ideally, of course, and we've already spoken about it, and there are young Indians here, and there are young Pakistanis here. Guys, we don't need to have a conflict. We, want to, we need to get past that. But till such time and we get past that, and there has to be a military balance, Pakistan needs a nuclear deterrent that is primarily uh, a, a deterrent in case of a conventional collapse, or in case of all-out war between the two countries. That's the theory. I hope that that's a theory that is never put to test, like mutual assured destruction between the Soviet Union and the United States never was. I hope that your generation will have the, uh, the, the, the smarts to understand that nuclear weapons may be a good thing uh, in terms of creating deterrence, but very frankly, they should remain in the theoretical realm, and that's not a deterrence that should actually be put into, uh, uh, into practice. Uh, I think what nuclear weapons capability has done for Pakistan is that it has deterred those in India who take the hardline view about Pakistan. Let's be very clear. There are people in India who think Pakistan should never have been created. They exist. Now, it's not the... It's not the state policy of the Indian government anymore. Nobody wants it. That's what we are told. But till such time as we can find that harmony between ourselves, we need that security umbrella that will make our people feel secure. Ideally, we want to get over 1947 and partition. In fact, I've written about it many times as an academic, though not recently as an ambassador. All I get to write these days are letters. Um, but, uh, but, but I made the argument, both sides need to go beyond partition and the, and the dynamic and the psyche that was created during the, during the process of partition. But till we get there, Pakistanis feel insecure about India. Pa India has a large conventional military. It has that, in, that military in, it has this huge armor cap capability, more than 5,000 tanks. Where are these tanks going to go? They are not going to go in the Bay of Bengal or the Arabian Sea. They are certainly not going to climb the Himalayas against China. Who are they intended for? They're intended for Pakistan. So if India is going to have capability that is Pakistan specific, Pakistan needs deterrence and that's what we have nuclear weapons for. Hopefully neither one of us will be stupid enough ever to use nuclear weapons. But we both need to be smart enough to understand why uh, Pakistan has the need for a nuclear deterrent. Yes. I'm Seema Bukhari. I'm a student at the Kennedy School here. Uh, Ambassador, thanks for an enlightening talk. It was very informative. Uh, you mentioned that there is a realization in the Pakistani government and a clarity to that effect that Taliban need to be put down and irrespective of the measures and uh, you're prepared to do that at any cost. And Pakistan over the time has seen uh, in these past years, there's, there's been a tremendous fallout in the streets and cities of Pakistan in the shape of these bombings that we've been having. And hundreds and thousands of innocent civilians have been killed in those. So uh, do you think, in your view, uh, in the context of this, do you see, a, a, I mean, Mir just mentioned a, a physical cost, a numerical cost. I'm talking about the emotional cost now. Do you feel that there is a tangible timeline or a time frame that you hope 
will end this sometime soon. And my second question is that you one, also mentioned. I'm going to have to limit you to one question. I apologize. Just because we have so many people who want to speak, and we're almost out of time. But thank you so much. I'll give a very quick answer to that. No, there is no timeline. And I can't fix an arbitrary timeline. But very frankly, people who think that it is legitimate for them to go and bomb mosques just because the people who worship there worship differently from the way they want to worship, and people who think they, can, they have the right to blow up people in bazaars because of whatever belief or cause they have, I think those people are not part of modern civilization. And very frankly, all the discussion in Pakistan that kind of says, yes, it's a, co uh, it's a cost on us emotionally, etc., it needs to be taken one step further and basically rally the nation and fight this and make sure that none of these people are tolerated, accepted, or approved of in any way. And that is the point at which we will be able to defeat them. There is, there is no way you can appease people who feel that they can walk into a mosque and blow themselves up because they are going to get 70 virgins in the hereafter and everybody else is going to go to hell. I don't think that those people are people that you can reason with. That said, there are many people who are foot soldiers of the Taliban who can be reintegrated into society, and Pakistan also has a program to do that. And hopefully, with concerted military effort to deny these people territorial control, we will come to a point where a large number of them from below will also start getting reintegrated into society. There is a socioeconomic dimension as well. People who are um, unemployed and have no future are more likely to be willing to blow themselves up. But that socioeconomic uh, process also will take years. It's not something that can happen over time, uh, over a couple of years. We need a, a, a comprehensive strategy, socioeconomic, educational, um, uh, uh, political, as well as military. And we are working on all of that, but there is no timeline. Yes, sir. Uh, well, my name is Richard Bond. I'm actually from the Caribbean, but since the early 80s, I've been a friend of a family named the Miangul. The, uh, your colleague in Canada is a member of the same family, and they currently have a nonprofit which is involved in raising funds for the reconstruction of schools and hospitals in uh, their former uh, area of Dominion, and it's called the SWAT Relief Initiative, and they're based in Princeton, New Jersey. They have a website. I wanted to circulate the information. Great. Thank There's you very much for the there. comment. Thanks. Thank you so much. Yes. Um, thank you, sir. My name is Dr. Sayama Firdos, and I work at the hospital um, affiliated with Harvard. My question is, the way madrasas were built um, a few years back, and every, most of the country supported them, how much effort is required to launch the same type of campaign so that we can build more schools and we make sure that wherever students go there to schools, they get more food and shelter in those schools? Because we need to break that vicious cycle of, you know, sending them because they don't have food and shelter, they send their children to madrasas. Do you think there is any hope uh, regarding that? Well, Saima, it's a very good question. Madrasa, of course, is a historic institution. It's been there since, uh, uh, since about the 11th century. Uh, uh, the problem is that some madrasas have become radicalized, and so we, we, Pakistan will always have some madrasas. People will learn uh, traditional religious uh, 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 knowledge, and uh, uh, it's like seminaries anywhere else in the world. What has happened is that some seminaries have been used to prepare young people to become foot soldiers for some kind of global or regional or local jihad. So our, the government's policy is to try and shut down the radical madrasas or at least curb them first. As far as the other madrasas are concerned, if we can have an operative, functional public school system, uh, then, yeah. Sorry to and, interrupt. And so the public school system, I think it will take uh, 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 several years. The government plans at this moment to double Pakistan's uh, expenditure on, on, on education uh, from 2.2% of GDP to about 4.5% of GDP within the next five years. And if we can do that on a sustained basis for a decade, then we can certainly make sure our first target should be to try and get all children between the age of 5 and 15 into school like our neighboring countries have been able to do. I mean, I already gave you the numbers. 92% of school-going age children in India, 98% in Bangladesh, and 96%, uh, 98 in Sri Lanka, and 96% in Bangladesh, and only 58% in Pakistan. We need to be able to invest in our education both through the government and through the non-governmental sector. But, but my 
Okay, they'll go a to very they'll quick they'll school, question. They'll, they'll go to schools, but the point is, once they won't have food, they won't. They don't want to go to schools. So I don't think we can have a. I don't think we can have a whole discussion on sort of how Pakistani primary school can uh, system can be restructured, etc. Here, I get your point. Uh, I again, as I say, first of all, there's 180 million people. It's very difficult for people sometimes to even understand the magnitude of Pakistan's problems sometimes. Um, you know, you can help and every other sort of Pakistani can help by bringing Pakistanis back to simply understanding the dynamic and, and, and people here, here who are connected with and intend to be connected with the media by bringing Pakistanis to start recognizing the problem that we have of our massive population explosion. I mean, nobody talks about it anymore because there'll be a fatwa against me, but as far as I'm concerned, there are enough fatwas against me that I don't care about another one. The truth is, we can't have this massive population explosion, multiplying population, we'll double our population in the next 20 years. Half of our population is below the age of 18. You know, 90 million people below the age of 18, providing schooling for them, providing all the benefits and incentives for them to come into school, etc is the sheer magnitude of it is enormous. It's just enormous. It's not easy. And for that, what you need essentially is will and focus. And I think we have the will, we can get the focus, and then we need to rally the resources. Thank you. I apologize to those who want to ask questions. I want to let these last two students here, microphone to my left, ask the final two questions, and then Ambassador will thank you for your candor and energy and dynamism and the thoughtfulness of your remarks. Uh, Ambassador Hakani, I'm a student at the medical school. Uh, my question for you is, what is your government doing to protect the rights of women and minorities in Pakistan right now, specifically in terms of repealing the dual ordinance? Uh, by the way, are you a Pakistani? I am a Pakistani. Okay, good. So it's your government, not mine. It's our government. It's the government of the people of Pakistan. It's the government of all Pakistanis. <laughs> It's uh, time we have. I wasn't allowed to vote in that election. That, that doesn't so. matter. That doesn't matter. I couldn't vote because I was Our abroad government. at that time. All I'm saying is whether we vote in an election or not, all Americans consider their government as their government. All Indians consider their government as their government. We Pakistanis need to change this attitude also. There are people who talk to me and they say, you know, the PPP government. And I say, with, with all due respect, the PPP government may have appointed me as ambassador. I'm the ambassador of all of you. And I intend Pointing to be the ambassador you. of all of you. That said, I think that the rights of women and the rights of minorities are very important for this government. Um, I, uh, there, there have been a series of legislation that has already come about in the Pakistani parliament, including, for example, uh, legislation against the harassment of women in the workplace. Um, several pieces of, uh, so several laws that are anti-women that, uh, that were introduced under the Ziaul Haq dictatorship are being reversed. Uh, minorities protection, uh, a, a lot of steps have been taken. Uh, the Minister for Minorities, in fact, recently uh, got uh, uh, favorable uh, uh, appreciation, uh, letters of appreciation from members of the American Congress for the work he has done in terms of taking uh, the stand on behalf of minorities. But we have a problem that goes beyond government. And I'll explain that to you in a minute. In a small town called Gojra, Somebody started a rumor against the Christian community of that town, and others went, went on rampage against the Christian community. And the provincial government, for political reasons, decided not to act. And the federal government only acted after the president came to know of it, and the president ordered the rangers in, and the Pakistani military had to go and protect the minority. Point I'm trying to make is, there has to be social action also to protect minorities. We can make law after law. The United States had laws to protect African Americans and uh, laws to uh, uh, allow them to vote much earlier than those laws were actually implemented in the 60s. So all I would say is that as far as the government is concerned, it's introducing a whole series of laws to protect minorities as well as to uh, pr protect women. But these are social issues as much as they are political issues. You and I are allies in trying to change attitudes within our society. I do not want my daughter to grow up in Pakistan if women are not going to be treated as equals of men and be respected the same way. And I and my daughter will together work for that objective. And you too should bear that in mind 
that this is also about raising consciousness and awareness. I'm very proud of the fact that you are here and that you are studying in the medical school here. All Pakistani women need to be able to have that right. In some social classes, it is just not happening. And we, who are the beneficiaries of whatever our uh, coincidence of our birth, uh, we need to work at it. But it can't just be done by legislation. But that said, it is a priority for this government. And on the legislative side, this government can say that in the last two years, it has passed much more in the legislative arena in terms of protection of rights for women and minorities than has been done in the preceding 15 years. Thank you for your question. Last question, yes, sir. Right here. Okay. Um, yeah, Pakistan often raises the con a concern about Afghan soil being used to destabilize Pakistan, and this is often a reference to the activities of Indian intelligence agencies there. Um, and these concerns are often brushed aside abruptly by Americans as well. Uh, my question to you is whether you've uh, raise the, the idea of some independent UN monitoring mechanism in Afghanistan to ensure that no country is using Afghanistan for any proxy war, whether it's India, Pakistan, Iran, US, or anyone else. Has this idea been raised, and what is the response like? Thank you. The, the, the idea that Afghanistan should not be used as a, uh, as a, 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 as a base for uh, destabilizing any country in the region is an idea that has not only been mooted but has been seriously discussed. Of course it will. It will take a lot of effort. The US has embraced the idea in principle. It's only a matter of being able to convince all the countries in the region to abide Monitoring. by. Monitoring. Well, independent as, monitoring. Let me just say that that is, as you know, any independent monitoring in Afghanistan is a sovereign issue for the government of Afghanistan, and it's not appropriate for the Pakistani ambassador to the United States to comment on that. It is something that the Afghans have to accept and decide. But the fact of the matter is that President Karzai uh, is also committed to making sure it's not in Afghanistan's advantage that Afghanistan's soil is used against any of Afghanistan's neighbors. It's not in Afghanistan's advantage that countries in the region should try for influence there. It has never worked well. And students of history will confirm that whenever these spheres of influence battles take place, it's never good for the country where these battles are taking place. So the Afghans want that. Pakistan certainly supports the idea. The United States does too. Uh, it's only a question of getting everybody on board and figuring out how to make sure that the commitments are upheld. That's where I'm going to leave the answer to your question. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much for your question. Ambassador, you have covered the landscape. We're very grateful, all of us, you've come to Harvard, to the Kennedy School. Thank you for your candor. Thank you for the commitment to a better relationship between our countries. It's been a pleasure. Please join me in thanking Ambassador Thank you. Thank you. Very good. Good.